guest for this episode is Laia Enuko. She is originally from Chicago and has lived in Milan, Italy since 1991. For over 25 years, she has been an Italian to English translator for fiction for all ages. Her recent translations include Glorious by Roberto Piumini, who has been nominated 3 times for the Hans Christian Andersen Anderson Award. Her other notable translations are The Women at Hitler's Table by Rosella Postorino, winner of the 2018 Campiello Prize and Lost on Me by Veronica Raimo, which was long listed for the 2024 International Booker Prize. In this episode, she spoke about the book Lost on Me and its author Veronica Raimo. You can use the link given in the show notes to buy Lost on Me. Welcome back to Harshneem Laya. Wonderful to see you here again. Hello Anil. It's good to be back. So Leia, what was your immediate reaction on getting to know that uh, the book Lost on Me got uh, long listed for uh, Booker? So naturally when I heard that Veronica and I had been long listed for the Booker Prize, I was needless to say overjoyed. Um but then to learn that there was not one but there were two books from Italy on the list was just fantastic. Um I think we're the only country with two authors instead of one. And because Una and I are friends. In fact, we just met up this morning for coffee. She lives in central Italy and I live up north in Milan and she was passing through and so we went out and we celebrated together. And I'm really happy for all of us and I'm also happy just for Italian literature because this year is a special year. In October at the Frankfurt Book Fair, Italy is going to be the country of honor, which is a pretty big deal that hasn't happened in a couple decades. So, um also in connection to that, I do have some news, and it's that since I was last on your podcast, I've heard back from the GLLI, which is the Global Literature in Libraries Initiative, and that's a network of librarians in the US who love books in translation and they want to fill their shelves with as many of, of them as they can and they hold themed months online uh with articles dedicated to different countries or different topics and i'm very happy to announce that with the GLLI the month of october 2024 is officially italian literature in translation month So each day we'll be posting at least one article that's been written by an Italian to English translator who talks about a book that they've translated and is available for purchase. The GLLI's followers can read about it and click a button to buy it for their libraries or their bookshop or if they're readers for their bookshelf. If you're an Italian to English translator and you want to contribute an article, we would love to help you get your book on shelves. So more information will be coming soon on my website leajanesco.com and if you'd like to propose a title you can write to me at itlit2024 at leajanesco.com and I have to point out that this is all volunteer there is no budget uh for this initiative um but this is one way we can all work together as translators to kind of add to the success to Italian literature and translation and hopefully see a, a bigger flow of italian literature in the english speaking market how did you get to this book and uh, start it translating this was kind of a stroke of luck for me i was speaking to a fellow italian to english translator who had just come to italy for vacation and she was going to spend a month here and was going to go sightseeing and enjoy italy and speak the language and see her friends and she was asked by Anna Stein who is Veronica's agent if she would translate a sample of Niente di vero so this translator decided she she you know debated for a while but she decided she would much rather spend her month in Italy seeing Italy and living Italy rather than you know sitting at a computer and working and so she gave them my name and i translated a few sample chapters and i wrote a synopsis um and Anna and Veronica both liked my work so they sent it off and just a month later almost to the day they wrote back and said that they had already signed an agreement with Grove Atlantic and they would like me to translate the rest of the book so tell us about uh, the author uh, Veronica Raimo Veronica is from Rome she was born in 1978 and she's authored novels and a screenplay a poetry collection 
She contributes to anthologies and magazines. In fact, her most recent book is a collection of short stories that she wrote in different periods of her life. The Italian title is fantastic. It translates into Life is Short, etc. She also translates from English into Italian, so she's translated F. Scott Fitzgerald and Ray Bradbury and Ursula K. Le Guin. Lost on Me is her fourth novel, and it's the second one to be translated into English. In Italy, it was a finalist for the Strega Prize, and it won the Strega Giovane and Viare Giore Pecci Prizes. Introduce us to Lost on Me, please. Lost on Me is a funny and often darkly funny novel about a woman who's a lot like its author, Veronica Raimo. They share the same name. They were both born and raised in Rome. They both grew up to be writers. And they're both utterly unreliable narrators. Um, The book skips back and forth through Veronica's life, uh, the character Veronica's life, from her childhood to today. And it gives us just these little glimpses of all the weirdness that left her so prone to fabricating lies. Um, Her father is a germaphobe, and he has this total aversion to the outside world. And he never allows Veronica or her brother to do dangerous things like going swimming or riding bikes or playing with other children. They're kept pretty much cooped up inside their home their whole childhoods. And it is a particularly cramped place also because he has this fixation with making new rooms in the house, but in the home by building walls inside their already teeny tiny apartment. Uh, just making things even more suffocating for everyone. Then there's Veronica's mother, Francesca. She is this smothering, melodramatic woman with really high anxiety, and she invades her daughter's privacy. She'll listen in on her phone calls and read her diary and, and somehow manages to track her down whenever the girl tries to escape for one reason or another. Um... When Veronica feels suffocated or trapped, which is practically all the time, she copes by losing herself to her imagination. For example, she writes a diary, but she fills it with completely made-up facts because she knows her mother is bound to read it. Um, And in a sense, this becomes her first work of fiction. Um, In fact, both Veronica and her brother grow up to be writers. She spends a lot of her lonely childhood imagining that she's this world-famous, globe-trotting rock star. Uh, After high school, she sees another classmate on the street. It's someone she doesn't really know particularly well. And she's terrified by the thought of having to make small talk with him. And, you know, panicking, she just blurts out that her father, who is alive and well, has just died. And the two of them go on to have this long, intimate conversation about how painful it is to lose someone you love, all because she felt trapped in that social situation. There are some hilarious uh, episodes in this book of her first crushes, her decision to get baptized when her brother does in elementary school, her dream of losing her virginity to her boyfriend in high school. They all fail pretty spectacularly. And then we also have very painful situations. Um, She sees her ex-boyfriend get married to someone else. She drifts away from her best friends who all start having children and, and, you know, starting families of their own while she decides that she really doesn't want to be a mother. She visits her father in the hospital when he actually is dying and says goodbye to him for the very last time. Um, All of this as an adult, leaves her with insomnia and depression and this unexpressed rage and a constant sense of anguish. And to cope with it all, she continues to make up stories and to tell lies. And not only to her friends and her family and her readers and strangers on the street, but even to herself. Um, And it gets to the point that she really has no idea whether the life that she remembers is her real past or even if the person she thinks she is, is the real her. And at the end of the book, we readers are left wondering how much of this novel is fiction, and how much of it might actually be about the real Veronica Raimo. The photograph on the cover page, whose photograph is that on the cover page? Is it Veronica's? 
So no, no, the the image on the cover that's not a picture of Veronica. But I am I thought it was really interesting to note that the same picture was used on the Italian cover as was used on the American cover as was used on the British cover because you know often they choose a different picture for different cultures and this one just seemed to work in all three different territories. What kind of interaction uh, you had with the author while translating? Oh, it was great working with Veronica. We looked in particular at a lot of the, there are a lot of cultural references in Lost on Me, and some of them were a little bit too obscure for the English speaking readership. And we thought for in some cases, maybe we should adapt, maybe we should delete. And in fact, as we were having just so much fun, uh, me and Veronica and her agent, Anna, we were having fun throwing around ideas of uh, titles for the English version, because the original title, Niente di Vero, is a play on words, and it means both nothing true and nothing about Vero or Veronica. And since in English we were going to miss that word play, we were looking for a different title that we could use. And... Veronica was the one who actually came up with the idea. We were talking about the cultural reference to Cornelia, who introduces her children and says, these are my jewels. Now, that is a reference that Italians will pick up on, but English speakers might not. And in fact, one of Anna's comments was, well, it was kind of lost on me. I think it'll be lost on the English readership. So maybe we could just delete that reference and Veronica not only said, okay, fine, but she also said, you know, that would make a great title idea lost on me. And it stuck. I think it, it's a perfect fit for her book. Because what we have is a character who is really struggling to grow into adulthood. And all these life lessons that she encounters sometimes are, are just kind of lost on her. And just a funny little anecdote. Please, sir, please go ahead. Veronica and I had been told a little bit in advance, like a week or so in advance, that we were included on the long list for the booker uh, that would be announced until the 11th, and we had to keep it under wraps. But she wrote to me a few days before then, and she she wrote, by the way, I was reading the rules of the prize and discovered that we both need to be alive till the 11th, <laughs> so please take care of yourself. Right. So on that morning, on Monday, on the 11th, I wrote to bear witness to my continued permanence on <laughs> Earth. Any specific challenge you faced while translating the book? Well, the challenge to translating Lost on Me was, without a doubt, first and foremost, the humor. Um, this book is full of wordplay, it's full of jokes, it's full of... Uh, she Veronica anagrammed her first and last name together. So that in itself was, you know, keeping me scratching my head for a while. Um, the humor just, this is a book that in Italian made Zero Calcare laugh out loud, and that's a very high bar. So it was a challenge to, to try to capture, to try to capture Veronica's voice and her sense of humor. There was also a mix of high and low registers, uh, but she always keeps the, the reader guessing. You never know exactly, like she has this chapter where she's talking about how um, you know, her family in her family, everyone swears a lot. And then she would use these very high register words um, in the mix. And so she keeps the reader guessing. But overall, I think that the conversational style, because this was uh, conceived as a series of monologues that were supposed to be performed in a theater. And the theaters were closed because of COVID. And so she wove these monologues together and it formed a novel. And as you'll have noticed, if you've read the book, it doesn't have the traditional story arc. It kind of takes you here and takes you there. And as I said, it keeps you guessing. And so because of this kind of conversational style, it's almost like someone is, you know, standing up and, and doing stand up comedy or just kind of telling you stories that all weave together. Um, one thing I always do in my translations, and I've done this for years, is one of the very final um, run throughs that I do is, you know, after all of my many, many, many rereadings, is I'll print out the entire book and I'll pace my apartment. And for hours, I'll spend it reading the entire translation out loud, cover to cover with my red pen so that I can mark down things that just don't, you know, I'll change them if they get clunky or if they're hard to pronounce or, 
that they just don't flow. And this is a book that the original just really flows really well. So I did this, I think I did it more than once to read the entire book out loud, cover to cover, to make sure that I kind of captured this style that that really is a conversational story that you're being told. Uh, Please read an excerpt from the book Lost on Me. The passage I'm going to read is the very last page of the book. A man whose opinion has become enormously important in my life recently told me my writing was frosty. Since he's a writer too, he can't have chosen the word by chance. It was neither an insult nor a compliment, or even a quiet observation. It was an opinion that went beyond our literary tastes, beyond criticism. Though deep down, if there's one good or bad thing in talking about literature, it's that it always turns out to be a pretext to talk about something else. His view was that I wasn't at all frosty in life, but did everything I could to be that way in my writing. I used books as a shield, dodged the most fragile, tender, and comical parts of myself. In answer to my girlfriend as to why I was writing this book, I could have said, I'm writing it for him. But now that I say it, it's as though the reasons were already someone else's. I thought back to what Rosa had said. A story is an ambiguous concept. To me, writing is essentially that. I write things that are ambiguous, frustrating. Even the few fairy tales I wrote as a girl were like that. Once, there was a stalk of wheat that grew in the woods. How'd that happen? My grandpa asked me. I have no idea. The story ended there. My grandpa was fine with that. So was I. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you for again coming out our podcast and giving your time. Thanks for having me on again. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you, Leah.